Hi, I'm David Whitwer. I'm the president of the Pennsylvania Historical Association, and I want to welcome you here today to a, a new initiative uh, that our organization has begun, which is that we're starting this year to hold a series of these sorts of Zoom webinars, uh, which we'll uh, link to our organization's Facebook page and also then uh, record and post on our organization's YouTube channel. Uh, and our goal here is we're seeking to harness this technology, which perhaps has been around a while, but as faculty members, we've become very familiar with uh, during the current pandemic. And we're hoping to use this Zoom webinar uh, technology as a way to, um, to publicize the activities of our organization and other allied historical associations and individuals involved in uh, Pennsylvania history uh, as a way to sort of promote uh, the history of Pennsylvania and the, the history of the Mid-Atlantic region as a whole. Now, today's webinar is gonna focus on an award-winning special issue from our journal, Pennsylvania History. And uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, our gratitude to the Pennsylvania Museums for this award. Um, it was uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Win uh, Museum's 2021 Institutional Achievement Award. Um, and the participants in today's webinar were people who were very much involved, in fact, uh, directed that special issue of the Pennsylvania History Journal. And so the other participants on today's webinar are Linda Reese, who's the editor of Pennsylvania History, and Professor James Legrand, uh, and Professor David Pettigrew, uh, both professors at uh, Messiah College's uh, Department of History. Uh, and they're gonna talk about um, their work in terms of promoting digital history, uh, but also their work in terms of promoting and putting together this award-winning special journal. And so with that as an introduction, I'm going to step aside now and let the real stars of the show talk a bit about their role in this. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Linda Reese. I am the editor of Pennsylvania History, the scholarly journal of the Pennsylvania Historical Association. And you're looking at the cover, an unusual cover for us, um, uh, relating to the special issue of Harrisburg Digital Public History and the City Beautiful. Um, We've had a number of special issues, special theme issues, which as, as the name sounds, it's uh, the entire issue is devoted to one topic. And this topic is Harrisburg and its city beautiful uh, movement at the turn of the last century. We've been producing special issues since 1952, about one every two years or so. Um, we've had 40 such issues uh, as a result, and I'm always open to any ideas for future special theme issues. I will mention that the next one coming up is a special issue on the Pennsylvania frontier in the summer of 2021. Uh, in 2015, at the Pennsylvania Historical uh, Association's annual meeting, I heard uh, Mr. Doctors Legrand and Pettigrew chair a session on uh, the digital public history project at Messiah College. And I thought, hmm, that might make a good special issue. And I heard them again about two years later speak at the American Historical Association annual meeting on the same topic. And uh, if that wasn't a good topic for a special issue, I mean, what was? Harrisburg was a national leader in the civic, uh, the City Beautiful movement with, with rock stars like J. Horace McFarland, um, Myra Lloyd Doc, uh, so on and so forth. So, um, and I was fascinated by the Digital Harrisburg Project's ability to tease out new information from traditional historical resources like the census and the Sanborn fire insurance maps to tell, to, to put a whole new spin on what happened in Harrisburg during the progressive era. So, um, and I was already fascinated by the city beautiful in Harrisburg because as I'm, I'm a retired archivist from the state archives and I worked with the papers of Myra Lloyd Dock and J. Horace McFarland. So I was already on board with this. So um, it was a win-win for 
uh, the journal and I think the Digital Harrisburg Project to produce this issue. Um, and I worked with uh, Drs. Legrand and Pettigrew and it took us about a year to get everything together because there are 22 authors and it was like herding cats. And we finally were able to um, get everyone on the same page. And I think, can we show the uh, next slide, please? Uh, this is the uh, table of contents and you can see there are, I believe 22 authors and it starts from reconsidering, well, there's like five parts, reconsidering the city beautiful, rethinking the city beautiful, remembering the city beautiful, reimagining the city beautiful. And we will get into all those uh, shortly. So um, I think without further ado, I want to say thanks to pamuseums.org for this Institutional Achievement Award. And at this point, I would like to um, turn it over to Drs. Legrand and Pettigrew. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, on behalf of uh, myself and uh, Jim Legrand for this uh, incredible recognition uh, for this special issue, we're so honored to get this, to receive this award and to have contributed to this special issue. It was an incredible piece of scholarship that we did. We began with uh, really the question of what caused City Beautiful? How did City Beautiful happen? William Wilson had that seminal article on City Beautiful. He also incorporated Harrisburg City Beautiful movement into the book. And I'm an ancient historian. I'm an archeologist and I was launching a new digital history class. And I came next door to Jim's office. And I said, Jim, what, what would be a good topic? And he said, David, why don't you do City Beautiful? Uh, and Jim, you probably remember that conversation, right? Indeed, I do. So that's what that's what got us going on this. And we started to um, look at Wilson's argument. And there was a lot that he did with the, the data that he had. He looked mostly at archival resources. He looked at uh, historical records. But he had limits in trying to understand why the population of the city voted the way they did uh, for the bond issue. Why was the movement so successful? And so uh, Jim and I started talking and we said, what if we tried something new uh, through my digital history class? What if we worked with the federal census data? And again, I, I'm a historian of the Mediterranean world. I'm an archeologist. And so this was a jump for me to come into this historiography, a whole nother conversation. But when I, when I saw federal census data for the United States, I, I was blown away by not only the detail, uh, but also the the, the degree to which historical, uh, publicly available federal census data was tied to places, individual street address. And so I, we, we said, this is a great, a great opportunity to revisit this question, what happened with City Beautiful? And so this journey began, which ultimately culminated in the special issue. Uh, along the way, we um, brought in articles that analyze City Beautiful. So I'll talk about some of those. Uh, we invited in scholars, uh, not all historians, journalists, um, art historians, uh, people who could provide different perspectives on City Beautiful. And then finally, we, we tied it to a public memory project. And that was um, really exciting as well. So we'll talk about each of those pieces. Uh, but this is the trolley. Uh, you're looking at improvements or a dead town. So there was an active campaign to vote for beauty, okay? And that's how it started off. And uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I convinced my students in digital history, who I didn't convince them, I assigned them a couple thousand names to type out from the federal census of 1900. Uh, so with 12 students, we typed out, uh, transcribed half the population of the city of Harrisburg in 1900. We then, uh, through other kinds of activities of the Digital Harrisburg Initiative, we were able to extend that work and to develop a massive database uh, for the, the first three decades of the 20th century. Uh, complete federal census record. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but the, the thing that really made this data come alive is the geospatial component. Uh, I met Albert Sarvis, Professor Sarvis at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology.
technology right around this time. And as an archeologist, I knew the kinds of things that you could do with this information. And so once we discovered the Sanborn maps, the fire insurance maps, the Harrisburg Title Company maps, we realized that we could link this data to individual street addresses that were digitized in GIS and open up a whole new world of possibilities for um, playing with, 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 with history, for thinking about uh, old questions in new ways, for making original arguments from the uh, data set. And so this uh, initiative was born. And the special issue is the culmination of that. So uh, I pass this on to Jim, talk about this next slide. So we're gonna go through some of the articles here, uh, some of the questions that we raised in the first part. Yes, this is a, um, a map um, with many, many uh, data points um, leading up to it. Um, but it, it addresses this fundamental question of who in fact were these reformers, these City Beautiful reformers, City Beautiful movement was part of a larger movement, an urban progressive movement. And uh, as opposed to, to David um, and all of his um, fields in which he uh, is, a, is a, a contributing scholar and an expert, uh, I'm a modern American historian um, with a focus among other things on uh, the history of cities. And so I recall uh, in these uh, 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 conversations in our offices, David and I would, uh, would tie this project back to this fundamental question about who in fact were the progressive reformers. There's a long historiography of this, um, lots of different answers. And what we found um, is that the situation in Harrisburg as we used um, countless pieces of, of uh, data and a really fine grained analysis. In some ways, the answer to this question in Harrisburg did to some degree correspond with what uh, other American historians looking at the regressive era, looking at cities had concluded. There are a significant number of what we might call um, professional class, uh, largely white, um, members of the community, prominent members of the community, members of prominent clubs and churches and other organizations uh, who were involved in uh, the City Beautiful movement, this reform movement. But there were also others. Uh, we discovered um, African-American residents who were troubled by what they saw as the costs of industrialization. One of the fundamental reasons for the City Beautiful movement is to try to come to terms with and to try to respond productively uh, to the costs of industrialization of dirt um, and uh, disease and congestion and what is perceived as a, um, a, a, a weakening of the public fabric, the community fabric in places like Harrisburg. And I suppose we shouldn't be surprised, but we, we concluded using evidence, using data, that there were others besides these white professional class reformers that responded to this call. Uh, local African-American uh, members and leaders responded. Uh, quite a number of immigrants, uh, including one prominent uh, Jewish rabbi uh, responded as well. And one of the things that was so essential uh, to this project, and Linda and David have already spoken to it, um, but let me note this as well, is that this project really, it's the most sort of uh, interdisciplinary project I've been a part of, one of the more interdisciplinary projects I've ever even heard of. Uh, people with many different uh, skill sets and disciplinary trainings all coming together here. One of the things that David and I were so pleased with was the way in which our students, our history majors and some other students at Messiah University, uh, some of whom were interested in GIS and uh, data analysis, some of whom were interested in maybe more contemporary questions about how do we serve and care for our community now and in the future? What do we make of this uh, legacy of, the, of, um, of the, the City Beautiful movement, which among other things, we'll look at this a little bit more later, but resulted in the displacement of a large number of people. 
we still see the remnants of that, even the costs of that today. And so some of the folks involved in this movement, um, as they looked at maps like these, were also um, really felt a calling um, to serve um, and to contribute to the good and to the flourishing of Harrisburg uh, now and into the future. So we can move to the next slide now. There are many, many different things that you can do with these uh, geospatial data sets. And uh, so immigrants, for example, were never a big part of the, the population of Harrisburg. Harrisburg was a small city compared to Philadelphia, reached 90,000 people. Uh, but nonetheless, there were all these small groups of immigrants. And so I, I partnered with a friend uh, at Franklin and Marshall uh, who's interested in the Greek population. We looked at two populations side by side using similar methods. And we were curious, for example, how did City Beautiful change the way that immigrant populations, especially new immigrant populations settled? And I'll get into this a bit more in a minute. Um, the, the Greeks are an, an interesting example because they, they come to the city in very small numbers. You can see the, if you can read the, the print on the screen, uh, by, by 1930, there are only 92 uh, residences that have Greeks, a very small population, 224 people. And Harrisburg never developed that Greek town, those Greek towns that places like Chicago develop, you know, where you have concentration. In fact, if you look at Lancaster, uh, their Greek population is much more clustered. And we were able to look at rents and property value. What we discovered as we related things to the city beautiful is that that disrupt of the old eighth ward created a housing problem in Harrisburg that wasn't there in other small towns in the area. It basically killed one of the cheapest housing districts of the city and the population was dispersed to the north and to the east. And so it was much harder for Greeks, Greek immigrants when they came in the early 20th century to find a home in the city. Uh, and that's what this map on the right shows uh, if you if you look, they're they're not actually in the cheapest rent neighborhoods, and that's because those neighborhoods are already occupied. Uh, they're for the most part in the second tier uh, neighborhoods, and they have a hard time getting settled in Harrisburg versus uh, another city like Lancaster. All right, let's go on to the next slide. How did ur urban re reform impact urban populations? I already mentioned the uh, the old eighth ward. The Old Eighth Ward, if you're familiar with Harrisburg, uh, was the bustling neighborhood, which is now under the Capitol Park, which is east of the state capitol. Um, and it is represented in this map on the left with these hash, hash lines. And in the 19 teens, actually by 1907, once the, once the city was cleaned up, uh, it had new pavements because the city beautiful, once the city uh, had new water systems, the attention naturally turned to the capital. The capital had been burned down at the turn of the, the century. A new, beautiful new state capital goes up. And then this creates a problem for urban reformers. What do we do about this old neighborhood to the east, which happened to be, of course, the neighborhood with all the new immigrant community, and the new immigrant arrivals, especially the Lithuanian Jewish population, um, and the most important African-American neighborhood of the city. And they wiped it out. So, you know, to make a long story short, they, after about a decade, they, they secured the relocation, um, basically the, the, the occupation of this neighborhood. They took down the homes, they raised them to the ground. And so we were interested in what happened to the people, right? How did this affect the entire urban fabric of the city? And what you're looking at there on the left is one of our students, Rachel Williams, she traced 100 families out of the old eighth ward. And so she's looking at um, the triangles are African-American families, whereas the red are um, Lithuanian uh, Jewish families. And you can see that they mostly concentrate, they mostly go immediately to the north. And then there's a subsequent displacement of this population in the 1940s. You can go to the next slide, I'll show you one other uh, different approach to this problem. This is by Professor Sarvis who is the geospatial technologist who's been so involved in our project. And he looked at entire populations. So instead of hand selecting families, he said, okay, let's look at the 
the different ethnic populations. First of all, we're going to look at the, the just general full population, so heads of households, what is happening over time, and what each of these concentric circles represents is basically the mean center of a population at different points in time. And so the red, the orange, the lighter orange, and the yellow, uh, you can see the growth of Harrisburg between 1900 and 1932, the, um, it's going to be to the, the northeast. But if you look at the African-American population, heads of households, the blue, it, it, it starts out in the same trajectory, uh, but it's based in that old age ward community. And then immediately in 19, by 1920, it is going straight north. North is this way on the map. And uh, that is a direct result of the destruction, the demolition of the old age ward. Okay, and you can show the next slide. And I think we have the Jewish population there. And you can see the Jewish population is more of a straight D line uh, to the north. And we have essays in the volume that explore the assimilation of the Jewish population over a 30 year period. All right, so that was what, another big question that we had. You can, you can go on to the next slide. And uh, I think I'll pass this back on to you, Jim. So we've noted that some of the articles in the journal uh, deal with various population groups, um, African-Americans, uh, different Jewish uh, groups coming to reside in Harrisburg, some of the roles they played in this, also some of the ways they were affected by uh, the City Beautiful movement. There are also a number of uh, really interesting, we think, biographical pieces, biographical sketches. Um, and one of them on uh, Myra Lloyd Doc, uh, pictured here, um, significant in many ways, significant even broadly speaking in the history of um, American urban progressive reform, particularly influential in the City Beautiful movement, um, and also significant certainly in the way in which she played a prominent, um, active, uh, influential role in public life as a woman. This was um, a much more unusual thing in her era. But Myra Lloyd Doc was one of the, the people um, who was aghast, I think in some ways, who was deeply saddened um, by the costs of industrialization, um, by the ugliness um, that seemed to uh, spread from industrialization, from, from factories, from factories that uh, progressives believe needed to have um, more regulation, more checks on their activities. Uh, concern too, uh, Myra Lloyd Doc was by um, all land uh, just being in private hands and having a, a, a sort of private logic determine everything. Um, Myra Lloyd Doc was someone who believed in the existence of and the need to protect something we might call a public good or a common good. Um, and this was certainly one of the things that um, drove her work, her vocation. And so one of the, uh, one of the biographical uh, essays in the journal um, uh, shares her story and also includes some interesting and really revealing a um, uh, series of correspondences she's had with her uh, contemporary reformers. I think next we have um, uh, a slide showing another one of our biographical pieces in the journal. And I am the one who authored that piece, so I will talk about it. Uh, Horace McFarland and Myra Lloyd Doc worked together. They were, they, they were kind of the tag team of uh, convincing Harrisburg to bring about the, the civic improvements. And my article is not necessarily biographical. It's more about how uh, McFarland used the power of photography to persuade his audiences to his point of view about um, getting cities, not only Harrisburg, uh, to clean up their act. And he estimated by 1909 that he had spoken to over 400 cities all over America uh, with his slide lectures. So he would go to a town and deliver a lecture. Um, one of his lectures was called The Crusade Against Ugliness, which is kind of obvious in what he was 
uh, about to do, but he would he would pepper his his talk with not so subtle images of uh, what he would call the beautiful and the ugly within the same image frame. For example, there uh, on the right is billboards at Third and Riley Streets in Harrisburg. Well, they're in the foreground of a church in the background, which is something positive, something he considered beautiful. So he he really hated billboards. The um, the other slide at the bottom, um, again, not too subtle, it's filtered before and after. It's fil unfiltered and filtered Susquehanna River water that gets pumped into the city. And that was one of the major arguments of City Beautiful was to clean up the water system, uh, the city fil to provide a city filtration system because there was cholera and typhoid uh, dominant and the people would put their garbage on the banks of the Susquehanna and Paxton Creek. So uh, McFarland um, really, as I said, not too, not too subtle. He, he was very positive that he knows we can do this. He, kn he knows we can get this together, which they did and were great. Um, and again, great examples for the rest of the country. And I think, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, I'm stalling here. Um, so I think maybe we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, Susan Rimby's uh, essay on, uh, on uh, Myra and Linda's essay on McFarland are just a couple of examples of the way in which we we're trying in this third section of the special issue to capture oblique views of the city beautiful. You know, we're just trying to, to capture things that had not been considered before, the, the Canberra Lynn, right? Um, we, we had essays on Wildwood Park. We had an essay on the, the Jewish synagogues that emerged that reflected be city beauty, beautiful ideals. We had an es essays on the Brunner plan and uh, and on um, other, um, trying to remember some other essays. Oh, also the, 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 the preludes to the city beautiful. We also uh, could not have predicted that the student essay uh, on the 1918 influenza pandemic would be so timely. You know, um, no coronavirus is not on the horizon, not on anyone's horizon when we uh, published this in early in 2020. The work that had been done was based on research, I think, in 2018, where our student, uh, Sarah uh, Wilson Carter, had gone to the county archives and typed up the death of people who died from the influenza in 1918, and then tied them to our census records and to our GIS, and was able to plot them on the, the map. And she just did a very short, basic essay in that third section about general patterns. And, and what she found is for, for, for sure, there were definite facial patterns to the death, high concentrations in specific wards, uh, wards that uh, were economically not as, um, as strong as other areas. Uh, neighborhoods near the railroad tracks were especially common. So think about communication of disease uh, you can drill down into this data and look at the interactions of, of you, can, you can see the patterns in individual neighborhoods. So you can see how two or three neighbors next to one another all had deaths connected to the influenza. And so this is a very powerful and, and timely little essay about, uh, you know, which, which, which reflects on public health in a time of urban improvement. You can go to the next slide. And so there are a lot of little, a lot of essays like that uh, in that third section. And so it makes for a fun section, Bellevue Park again, um, that's uh, Warren Manning on the left. Uh, we also have uh, Reservoir Park uh, are the, the, the top two. And you can go, to, go on to the next slide. Uh, but the unexpected, I think the really unexpected uh, twist to this special issue, which we would not have, we weren't planning when we first put it together, really, Jim and I were thinking that most of the essays 
in the issue would be like that first section, which deal with the analytical side. We couldn't find enough people to play with the data. So we uh, put the call out for historians, journalists, people we knew, we, we knew who did local history and were interested in it and uh, got those people involved. But then right about the time that we were putting this essay together, uh, the Digital Harrisburg group was invited to contribute to this amazing new project called the Commonwealth Monument Project, which was dedicated to celebrating the, the commemoration of the 15th and 19th Amendments, uh, and also putting a new monument on the lawn of the state capitol grounds that would be dedicated to the African-American community. There was no real monument in Harrisburg to the history of African-American community. There are a lot of famous African-Americans um, famous on the national level, people involved in the Harlem Renaissance, uh, people involved in, 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 uh, in, in lobbying, uh, you know, important Republicans, important Democrats uh, who came through the city. Some of them lived in the city and the, this community had not been recognized. Uh, also the immigrants, the immigrant community that was based in the old days were not been recognized. So this project, the Commonwealth Monument Project uh, offered an opportunity to think long-term about the city beautiful and to, to rethink what it meant to, what it meant for many people um, to embrace progress while at the same time discontinuing important traditions of the city. The, the neighborhood of uh, the old eighth ward was wiped out. This monument, which you can go and visit today um, uh, on state capitol grounds just went in in August and actually was completed in the fall. And on uh, there are four notable orators and they surround a pedestal and at the top of that pedestal is a 3D reconstruction of the historic old eighth ward. On the sides of the pedestal in relief are images based upon images of the state archives, which were taken in the 19 teens as the neighborhood was coming down. And then 100 names, 100 important people, uh, mostly African-American men and women, uh, but not all, um, people who had a notable influence on their community in their day. And so we use that final section of the volume uh, actually, we have a review essay by Lisa uh, Kreese off phone, but we use the, the final main section of the, the special issue to talk about this project, to try to re-remember, recast, or reimagine the city beautiful through other eyes, through public eyes. And so if you can go to the next slide, we, had, uh, we have an essay by the artist of the monument. She describes the monument. We have essays dedicated to remembering the old eighth ward, a look up, look out campaign that we created through posters directed to people in the state capitol building. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So there's the look up, look out. Uh, and all of this came right out of the Digital Harrisburg uh, initiative, as well as our partnership with uh, community members. And so it was a great, great project. It's been a great project. It was fun to be able to celebrate that project and, uh, and connect it to the city beautiful. I think there's one more slide here that I wanna show. Yeah, so what you're looking at here is, uh, that's my colleague, our colleague, Jean Corey, who's the director of the Center for Public Humanities at Messiah, and she's the one closest to the sign. And she is with middle school students from Harrisburg, and they have taken our digital Harrisburg data, the census data, and they have walked to the state capitol grounds um, and they uh, and she and students led a po poetry workshops to write poems about these individuals who used to live uh, in a place that is now a park. And so her poetry workshop, these poetry workshops have been amazing. And so we have a, a final uh, piece in the volume on uh, the public memory through poetry. Is there anything else that you want to add to this, Jim or Linda, before we close? Oh, Linda's, Linda's muted. We would be remiss if we did not thank the Historic Harrisburg Association and Messiah College for helping to fund this special issue. As you can imagine, it's an outsized issue. It's, uh, it's uh, 240 pages where it's normally 140. And there's lots of uh, color, color images in the issue. 
and they really helped with the funding. So I would, I would like to thank them very much. Okay, well, uh, I think that's a, a great full circle uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it, as you can tell, it's a fascinating uh, issue uh, with a fascinating topic and, uh, and really cutting edge research as I think uh, all the presenters described both, both that notion right the, of the interdisciplinarity of it. So this range of different disciplines but also this new cutting edge uh, 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 research methodology, digital and then you know, from my point of view, one of the most compelling parts of it is just the way in which uh, it integrates the work of students and a range of scholars. And then here with this last slide, right, we see the way in which it, it's, it's, it's brought even to the, to the role of, uh, of, of children in school and, and heightening a, a, a different sort of sensibility about, uh, about our relationship to the city around us. And I think that's, that's really the, the best that, uh, that urban history can do. So it's, it's a very impressive issue, which is of course why it won the award that it did. Uh, if you don't have a physical copy of it and, uh, and your library doesn't, then that's, that's a crying shame and you should demand that your library uh, get subscribe to the Pennsylvania history. But it turns out there's an, another way to access it, which is through, uh, through a JSTOR, uh, which your library uh, may well have. And uh, with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna say thank you so much to the participants. And thank you for those of you who've uh, tuned into our broadcast. And uh, thank you uh, and goodbye.